As we record this, Russia has invaded Ukraine. And we, everyone's asking us, uh, what are we seeing in the body language of Putin during his speech? So Greg's found some great video for us to analyze. Why don't you tell us about that video, Greg? Yeah, so these videos come from two separate occasions. There were two separate videos that we took the clips from. One was in June or July of 2021, an NBC interview with Putin, and it's really good face to face. And then the other is his last speech before the invasion began. And we'll get to see some very different Putin. But this is a great spotlight on what his body language is. This is a response to two things. We constantly are asked for a foreign language video where we can't understand the language. So we'll have one that is has um, text and one that is an actual interpreter and you'll see the difference. And we've been asked a lot for Putin. What, what should Americans worry? What might happen next if there's no agreement on cyber? You know, this is the same as space militarization. This is a very dangerous area. At some point in the past, in order to achieve something in the nuclear area, in terms of confrontation in the area of nuclear weapons, the USSR and the United States did agree to contain this particular arms race. Cyberspace is a very sensitive area. As of today, a great deal of human endeavors rely upon digital technologies, including the functioning of government. And of course, interference in these processes can cause a lot of damage and a lot of losses. And everybody understands that. And I'm repeating for the third time, let's sit down together and agree on joint work on how to achieve security in this area. That is all. But what is bad about it? I don't even understand. I'm not asking you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but for me, as an ordinary citizen, it would not be clear and understandable. Why is it that your government refuses to do it? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, let's start off by talking about the intelligence part of this. This guy is a, he was a case officer. He's been in the business forever. He was a KGB officer. I think he was a colonel. Notice his lack of a pause as he responds through the interpreter. That probably indicates he has pretty good passive English, but there are lots of reasons, and Mark can talk to those, why you would use an interpreter. Number one, it gives you time to think. As an interrogator who speaks Arabic, I've actually had many times I used an interpreter, so I'd get time to think of my next question. So there's number one. Number two, he does this eye block, and then he does a mini explosive breath and catches it with a stop. That indicates frustration with the question. He does a wrinkle brow and he emphasizes frustration and irritation intentionally probably as he drives home his point. As he emphasizes most things that he's positive about or that fit, fulfill what his needs, he uses his left hand. You'll watch. When he raises his right hand, it's usually a negative thing or some other reason. He'll drive his brow down to make his point and then he is he does the concern piece. And my favorite is the one shoulder when he says, everybody knows. I'm not trying to beat you up. I love both of those. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, he actually was in Eastern uh, Germany as an interpreter. I mean, obviously, he wasn't actually interpreting. He was a, an asset there for the KGB. So my guess is he has actually some good language skills across a bunch of different languages. He is buying time with having this interpretation going on here. Uh, where else is he trained? Well, we know as well who he trained in body language with. It was Alan Pease in 1991 when he was deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. Alan went over there to get him and uh, others uh, in the Kremlin um, to be a little kind of lighter, a little less aggressive, a little less like um, the, the kind of the shoe hammering Russian autocrat. So Alan helped um, Putin be more likable. And so I think we're getting some of that work coming across as well. What do we see here? So he leans to one side. It's pretty casual, isn't it? Or the idea of him being casual. He shifts positions to a to where he's talking about dangerous area and this idea of um, uh, militarization. We have some looks for approval on let's sit down together. Those looks of approval are totally out of 
character for somebody who has been K- KBG uh, uh, K- uh, trained. Uh, you imagine you're walking through Eastern Europe. You don't want to be raising your eyebrow at people's, people you know. You want to suppress all of that because you don't want to give away who you're getting approval from, who you know, who you don't know. So I would say that look of approval is put on at that point. What else is put on? I think his look up as well um, around, um, I don't understand. I don't really understand this. And this is faint, is, is a faint. He's trying to pretend he doesn't understand. There's not a lot here that is really honest that's going on. Lots of playing for pauses, lots of playing for time. There, I'll leave it at that. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Um... When he blows out that little puff at the beginning, that's almost a dismissal when he goes like that. So he's, he's showing he's, this is not any big deal to him. However, when he closes his eyes, this lets us know this is rehearsed, and he's lining up, he's getting ready to go for and, and talk about what he's he's rehearsed so far in, for that situation. And when he leans on his left, that's sort of his baseline for the for letting go of the stuff that's really important, the things that he's made up his mind about and that he's serious about. The things on his right hand, like Greg was saying, those are the... Those are the um, more um, not negative in this case as negative as because uh, I'm saying from his from his point of view to us things are negative but for him it's 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 negative on that side but the other ones are positive for him on the on his left side lean in other words uh, we see that posture shift and he's getting ready to get into the deeper details at that point usually when you see that somebody's they're, they're taking a little bit of time to think and they're getting ready to to uh, give you that new information or get into the deal details of something we see that foot raise going up and down his chair as he goes back and forth that's part of his baseline he's done that for years we've seen that forever he's got those legs spread out and his hands like this and those feet are going back and forth uh, i believe we talked about him once before and, and the same thing came up there um i talked about his right hand illustrating uh, for for it really open when he's talking about those things and then we see the shoulder smug sh- shoulder shrug and a smile and i think he's a little bit stressed there at that point i think we're seeing some stress come on because i think he's talking a little bit too long for this and then the hand swap that's more of a dismissive thing for that subject as, as he's as he's dismissing that just uh, the dismissal of that part of the, the subject there um and then is that right eye? Now, if you look really quickly or really closely, you see that quick right eyebrow keeps going down. There's a lot of stuff. I think he's got a lot of Botox going on. That's why he looks so glassy and glossy in there. But there, I think there'd be a lot more going on in the um, glabella and the forehead and the eyebrows if he wasn't so Botoxed. So I'm not sure how much emotion's coming through there, but we see that that right eyebrow just popping a lot. So be sure and watch that on the next the next time around. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. And that was wonderful to see that there's a positive and negative that helps us to see how he might view something in a future video. We see an incredible rise in blink rate here and blink rate means how often we're blinking and high blink rate means stress. Low blink rate is usually focus. So a person gets either focused on something good or bad, like a target. Uh, It's the same thing. But we typically see blink rate go up when someone's being deceptive or when someone's stressed out. So it averages around 15 per minute and his shoots up to around 70 per minute during his mention about cyber being a dangerous area. We also see some digital flexion. His fingers are curling in towards the chair right when he's talking about cybersecurity being a sensitive area. His his foot here. uh this movement is a baseline, but it doesn't occur all the time. Like it's not constant throughout the whole interview. So I think it's a valid just to look at when it starts and when it stops. And I think it's just about a valid data point. But I think what we're seeing here is his foot's moving for a few different ways. I think he's defaulted into this swivel movement that you're going to see first because the soles of his shoes are brand new. He's wearing brand new shoes. So they're probably smooth. He's probably been doing that. Uh, before the interview but this anti-gravity upward kind of movement of the shoe is a technique taught in many spy schools from cia to mi6 and one of the reasons is the further a body part is from the head the harder it is to control during anxiety or excitement that's my rule of thumb and they teach spies and stuff to burn off excess energy or excess adrenaline by wiggling the feet, curling up the toes, all that kind of stuff is also what you learn in how to beat a polygraph. 
So he's got a, a pretty good strategy. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate a strategy that's going to apply to almost just about every video that you're going to see here and anywhere else. And here's the exact Putin strategy. That make a statement that nobody can disagree with that's generalized and high altitude, kind of looking over a big, general, vast thing. Then make two more statements that are equally known to everybody, but gradually focusing more on the topic at hand. Then socialize the consequences or the issue, you know, that everybody understands that or everyone will understand during this little shrug that he has here. And Putin's more likely to do these little shrugs for agreement to, to show that people agree with this. So Putin's next step is discussing simple actions and make the criticism of those simple actions laughable. And finally, he wants to show how he's been victimized or Russia has been victimized and then question he always uses questions and he doesn't use questions to make you answer them. He uses questions to drive your focus. Asking any human being questions will drive focus. Questions always drive focus. So he gets you agreeing with him in the beginning, then starting to narrow down, then making the opponents laughable, and then drives where you focus on after that by using very targeted questions. And you're going to see that a whole lot here coming up. So, there's some other stuff with psychology that we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes that I think is fascinating, but that's all I got in, on this one. Hey, a couple right. of points to make, guys. Culture matters. So in some cases, we're going to see some things that are cultural, but he's keenly aware of the Western culture and knows what he's doing. Choice of words matter, and we can't tell his choice of words. So we're working off of what we can see. We're working off of body language, and we may miss something cultural. For example, when you pronounce a certain word, your mouth may move a certain way. But what we do know is the mechanics of the trade he came from. So we can see a lot of that in here as well. What, what should Americans worry? What might happen next? if there's no agreement on cyber? You know, this is the same as space militarization. This is a very dangerous area. At some point in the past, in order to achieve something in the nuclear area, in terms of confrontation in the area of nuclear weapons, the USSR and the United States did agree to contain this particular arms race. Cyberspace is a very sensitive area. As of today, a great deal of human endeavors rely upon digital technologies, including the functioning of government. And of course, interference in these processes can cause a lot of damage and a lot of losses. And everybody understands that. And I'm repeating for the third time, let's sit down together and agree on joint work on how to achieve security in this area. That is all. But what is bad about it? I don't even understand. I'm not asking you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but for me, as an ordinary citizen, it would not be clear and understandable. Why is it that your government refuses to do it? Cool. Let me ask you another direct question that you uh, can answer, and it's an allegation that has been made, an accusation that has been made again and again now uh, in the United States. Uh, the late John McCain, uh, in Congress called you a killer. When President Trump was asked, uh, was told that you are a killer, he didn't deny it. When President Biden was asked whether he believes you are a killer, he said, I do. Mr. President, are you a killer? <laughs> Look, over my tenure, I've gotten used to attacks from all kinds of angles and from all kinds of directions under all kinds of pretexts and reasons and of different caliber and fierceness. And none of it surprises me. People with whom I work and with whom I argue on the international arena, we're not bride and groom. We don't swear everlasting love and friendship. We are partners. And in some areas, we are rivals. As far as harsh rhetoric, I think that this is an expression of overall U.S. culture. Of course, in Hollywood, because we did mention Hollywood at the beginning of our conversation, there are some 
deep things that undoubtedly can be referred to as works of uh, cinematic art, but more often than not it's macho behavior, and that is also part of U.S. culture, including political culture, and it is considered normal. By the way, not here. It is not considered normal here. If this rhetoric is followed by a suggestion to meet and discuss bilateral issues and matters of international policies, I see it as desire to engage in joint work. If this desire is serious, we are prepared to support it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I heard you answer the question, the direct question, uh, Mr. President. I did answer. I did. I will add, if you let me. I have heard dozens of such accusations, especially during the period of some grave events during our counter-terrorism efforts in North Caucasus. And when it happens, I'm always guided by the interests of the Russian people and the Russian state. And sentiments in terms of who calls somebody what, what kind of labels, this is not something I worry about in the least. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it is a direct question, potentially not as direct as it could be, because really I think the question is about war crimes, I think. I think the real question is is not here, you know, have you knocked off the odd person? Uh, it's really, uh, have you indulged in, in war crime? And so the question to an extent is actually not that direct. It's a little bit soft. And so he manages to steer past it in all kinds of ways, into Hollywood, into the ideas of being macho. But look, he does open up, but then you see him shift. Uh, he laughs and then breaks away with his eyes. I think there's something quite aggressive about that laugh. It is a demeaning laugh in many, many ways, but I think it might have um, another purpose, which is to brush aside as well, give the body and mind something else to do at the same time. The big indicator for me around some veracity to this idea of him being a killer is he's hanging on to that chair and he's just got a little bit of self-soothing going on on the edge of the chair there. That, you know, given his, his baseline, I think when he is supremely confident about an answer, it's, it's outside of, of that. Um, Greg, what have you got on this one? Yeah, this is one of those I'm always talking about, a person looking like a swan, fluidly moving over the water, and you look under the water and their feet are paddling like hell. This is him right now. And he is, an. In, I, my note says, Intel Pro versus Reporter. Big difference in the two. One of them asks questions, the other drives behaviors. And if you watch him, he starts to nod before the guy's question is even out of his mouth. He understands what he's saying. Pretty simple to get there. That laugh, Mark, is the equivalent of when people today say something like, yeah, think, trying to be sarcastic. That laugh is, ah, <laughs> he's just excusing you, you as an idiot is what he's doing. And then he doesn't answer. He, his hands are moving the illustrators. He understands exactly what's going. His face shows amusement. His face lightens up. You can see all through here, he's amused. And then he drops his chin and pulls Taffy with his eyes. He's playing coy. That, a little kid doing that, you know they're playing coy from a distance. He's doing that and he touches his chin at rhetoric just as he's thinking about which word maybe to use, I don't know exactly. This is not just chaff and redirect, this is masterful chaff and redirect. He's redirecting and taking an accusation, a criticism, anything you want to call it back toward the US when he does a provocative statement to say, it's just not in our culture. He's wanting the guy to defend, and when the guy defends, he'll go in a different direction. So the guy says then, well, I don't think you answered. And then my note says, I did answer and I'll do it again. Just give me the floor. He just is masterful in controlling the conversation. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, you hit it right on the head. He is a master at controlling human behavior and driving focus and, and what people are actually focusing on. His usual eye accessing, and when we say what eye accessing, when we use these terms, this is where a person, you know, we look around to access some of our memories. His usual place that he goes is around hour nine o'clock as you're looking at this video when it comes back on. That's his typical place. But he immediately begins with calling attention to his own victimhood over the Russian people instead of the Russian people. And I think it's very telling uh, that he was reluctant to mention Hollywood without mentioning that someone else brought it up, that it was already in the conversation. He wanted that to be known. And he, the, the translator says, look, at the beginning of the video, that is not what he says. He says, listen to me. 
Those are his exact words. Uh, so there's a, it's a very different sensory organ that if a person's talking about listening versus looking, uh, and he's not a very visual person, he speaks in auditory words most of the time. And there's some, there's a contempt micro expression that right towards the end when he said the words, who called someone what? And I think that's pretty telling about how he sees the West and how he sees leaders in the West. And you can go look up how he speaks about those people. But what we're really doing here is form, trying to form a psychological profile, not just a reaction to one little clip. We're trying to give you an insight into the person. And, and one of the first things that I do as, as a profiler is ask a question like, what behavior do they repeat that they ensure is seen by other people? What is a repeated behavior that they want other people to see? And he launched a campaign of photo shoots like a teenager with a brand new Instagram account when he started down this down this road. But they were all extreme projections of masculinity and virility and strength and power. And then so step two of this profile is to understand that this is likely a source of deep seated insecurities and fears. So the next there's two more steps. Next is this behavior is likely a way to conceal what is usually the opposite of that behavior. So if it's extreme on one end, it's probably concealing something that it's the opposite of. And I think this alone is a really powerful profile by itself, just understanding this about anyone you work with, anyone you're talking to. And we're going to dig into this as we move forward. But it's especially true when it comes to public figures. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, when, when he opens up, he's got uh, his eyes closed, that head down. And when he does his head forward, that's an affirmation of, OK, let's get started. And, and he understands what's coming. So he knows what's what's happening. See the arms open and his open smile. And that happens pretty quick. And that's and when he does that, it's almost like, I don't know. I don't know, man, because he's asking me if he's a killer or not. So he's like, I don't know. Or, I'm not aware of that or I don't know. So like it's almost like a, a little badge he's giving him there. He's, he's, he's approaching it that way. And he says, after you are a killer. Or after he says, are you a killer? We see lots of brow movement in there, even surprise going up. I think that's all fake. We see a lot of fake in here, like Mark was talking about earlier. We see that, 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 that little wave, and then his thumb comes up and touches his mouth at that point. Um, that's, that's, that's another fake thing, Sean. He's trying to go into this depth of thought that he's getting ready to, to start talking about something he's really thought a lot about, and it, it has a lot of meaning for him. But I think that's fake as well. Um, and then he, his, his gaze goes away from from the interviewer. He's looking over here, talking a lot, because he doesn't want to be interrupted. He's letting this thing go. So he doesn't have that connection where the guy can go like this to stop him. That's what it looks like to me anyway. Uh, we see that um, the large hand illustrator was talking about the, the differences in the culture there. When he talks about culture. His whole thing is, is everything he talks about in all these videos, just about every one of them, he's posing the U.S. Uh, the US against Russia. Every time, everything is just bad. How we're how the U.S. is is doing this, but they're just trying to do this, and the U.S. is being aggressive, but they're just trying to do that. So it's real. It's really something to, to to pay attention to here because it's really setting up what we're going to see in the second group of videos. Um, again, the foot tapping. That's another part of his baseline. He does that all the time. He's just that's just helping him keep. Like Chase was saying earlier, I'm sure it's helping him stay relaxed, and he's just he just does that quite often. Um, when he says you didn't answer the question, his cadence speeds up. It's a lot quicker, but he gets a lot quieter. Now, when he's doing that, that's when he backs up just a little bit. He's trying to escape from this, but there's no way out because he's trying to think of what the answer of the uh, answer he needs to give. So it sounds like the an answer, a correct answer to his question, which he really doesn't give. And we see a lot of uh, movement in the left eyebrow, you know, with his head tucked, like uh, Greg was talking about. And these are, in this case, those are sort of defensive cues because at that point he's he's sort of in the corner and he has to has to come out um, swinging with with this supposedly uh, correct answer to the question that he was given. Let me ask you another direct question that you uh, can answer, and it's an allegation that has been made, an accusation that has been made again and again now uh, in the United States. Uh, the late John McCain. Uh, in Congress called you a killer. When President Trump was asked, uh, was told that you are a killer, he didn't deny it. When President Biden was asked whether he believes you are a killer, he said, I do. Mr. President, are you a killer? <laughs> Look, 
Over my tenure, I've gotten used to attacks from all kinds of angles and from all kinds of directions under all kinds of pretexts and reasons and of different caliber and fierceness. And none of it surprises me. People with whom I work and with whom I argue on the international arena, we're not bride and groom. We don't swear everlasting love and friendship. We are partners. And in some areas, we are rivals. As far as harsh rhetoric, I think that this is an expression of overall U.S. culture. Of course, in Hollywood, because we did mention Hollywood at the beginning of our conversation, there are some deep things that undoubtedly can be referred to as works of uh, cinematic art, but more often than not, it's macho behavior, and that is also part of U.S. culture, including political culture, and it is considered normal. By the way, not here. It is not considered normal here. If this rhetoric is followed by a suggestion to meet and discuss bilateral issues and matters of international policies, I see it as desire to engage in joint work. If this desire is serious, we are prepared to support it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I heard you answer the question, the direct question, uh, Mr. President. I did answer. I did. I will add, if you let me. I have heard dozens of such accusations, especially during the period of some grave events during our counter-terrorism efforts in North Caucasus. And when it happens, I'm always guided by the interests of the Russian people and the Russian state. And sentiments in terms of who calls somebody what, what kind of labels, this is not something I worry about in the least. <laughs> we good? All right. In the case of neighboring Ukraine, uh, earlier this year, the European Union said you had more than 100,000 uh, troops on the Ukrainian border. Uh, was that an attempt to get Washington's attention? <laughs> Look, first, Ukraine itself constantly, and I think is still doing that, it kept bringing personnel and military equipment to the conflict area in the southeast of Ukraine, Donbass. That's one. Two is that we conducted exercises in our territory, and not just in the south of the Russian Federation, but also in the Far East and in the North and in the Arctic. Simultaneously, military exercises were being held in different parts of the Russian Federation. At the very same time, the U.S. was conducting military exercises in Alaska. Do you know anything about it? Probably not. But I'll tell you that I do know. And that is in direct proximity to our borders. But that's in your territory, on your land. We didn't even pay attention to it. What is happening now? Now, at our southern borders, there is a war game, Defender Europe. 40,000 personnel, 15,000 units of military equipment, Part of them have been airlifted from the U.S. continent directly to our borders. Did we airlift any of our military technology to the U.S. borders? No. All right, Chase, what do you got? So, again, in this video, we're not hearing him actually say, look. He says, listen. Right at the beginning, my Russian is decent enough to pick that up. And he also starts saying... Uh, we have conducted training operations. He starts talking about themselves first, but that is against his narrative. So he switches back to talking about Ukraine first, then makes Russia number two. He wants to say someone else did it. Why can't I do it? Jimmy got the toy. I need to get a toy. And that's that's the way he typically does this. But he's accidentally started talking about Russia first. There's more three o'clock eye accessing uh, for his his three o'clock. For his eye home, right at the start, there's hand slapping down right when he's mentioning Ukraine. He does it twice, this hand coming down. I think that is really interesting because I've never seen him. I've analyzed a lot of his speeches. I've never seen him do that when talking about the Ukraine or I think anything. But as he describes the exercises Ukraine is doing in Donbass, his blink rate triples. And this is a really powerful indication of stress from 
I think the issue, I don't think it's stress about Ukraine, but stress about the fact that another country can encroach on his territory and he gets to feel slighted. And even more than that, he gets to feel slighted in public. When he was a kid, this is on record, even a teacher reprimanding him in front of his friends, he would go into this wild outrage and outbursts of uh, anger and almost vengeance. So he's known for this. But everything that we're hearing here is fact, 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 and fact. What he's saying is a collection of facts, but that doesn't make this 100% truthful. He's still framing how those facts are shown to you in order to paint Russia and himself as a victim. And he's earned the title in some intelligence circles as the wound collector. And we'll expose a little more about that here in the future. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, let's first start by talking about propaganda. <clears throat> All propaganda is, is holding up a mirror that you can see what you want to see, not what the truth is. And half-truths are masterfully used in propaganda. Spent a lot of my life tied up in Cold War era, so I know that masterful kind of propaganda that the Soviet Union used, and he grew up in that world. Very different from today. All you have to do is stop short of facts. And when people are amused with themselves, that they are getting you and they have you on the ropes, it shows in their face, look in his face. So he starts off by either this language was more complex than he expected, or he's delaying, because we know he picks up on passive English pretty well. Here he delays and he does a little facial expression and then he answers. To your point, Chase, regardless of whether the interpreter, if the interpreter always says look instead of listen, it could be agreed upon with Putin to say, hey, here's the message I want you to say is look. Or it could be that that guy's very visual and he's just saying, I'm putting him on notice. Same thing. It's why, Scott, you talked about when you interrogated through an interpreter, I would say, say exactly what that guy says. I want to hear exactly what he says because you lose something otherwise. So he comes out of there with that that amused smile, but it's not genuine. There's no eye engagement. So this is kind of the prey smile, the ha ha ha, I got you now. He telegraphs impatience. He's got a sarcastic smile where part of his face rises and the other part doesn't. And then he puts him on notice. Watch him fold his hands slowly into this. That isn't steepling, that's a power move. And we call that steepling a power move, but this is a power move. When you're doing that, I'm holding back is what that's signaling to the guy. And he's keenly aware he's signaling that. And then anytime again, he's doing that strong messaging his left hand is doing, especially when it's positive and his weak right hand does the other. He goes straight into a lecture and he starts delivering those facts. And guys, I'm gonna also tell you, I've pissed off many collection guys by saying, you have to be able to think like the guy to be able to get the information. If you start now to pay attention to what we're seeing, we're starting to see a guy who has this vision of being crushed in by NATO to where NATO is should be called the anti-Russia association. That's what he's drawing the picture here. Yeah. Now, if he perceives that, then it becomes reality. And Chase, I'll leave with this. I'll take the category world leaders who are also narcissists for $10,000 because there are plenty of them. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, yeah, the at the top there, that laughing part is totally to make it look like it's it's just dismissive and it's 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 amusing him, and then his eyebrows up and his and his forehead for and his head forward like that. One time I'd I'd been talking to uh, or I'd sent Greg a video of a of a fella who was being interviewed for a financial situation, and he had this really odd look on his face, the same one Putin had right there. I said, what are you seeing here? What is this? What am I missing? And Greg said, that's his teaching face. He's teaching these guys something. He's telling them, this is the way that's done, and this is how you do that. I've seen it a thousand times, but I wasn't able to put words to what I was seeing at that point. I said, so Greg, you nailed that, and that's that's what Putin's teaching face looks like. Um, now, the, the fist to the, side of the, to the side of his face, that's when he's claiming that he's claiming the uh, the ownership of what he's talking about there, and then that hand up and, and push away. That, that's illustrating that um, that that this is big, and that the U.S. is far away, and these places are far away. They're not they're not there. They're they're at a distance uh, during all this. Um, then he throws his hands out, and he but he see, and he sees to show he sees the interviewer as the same as the U.S. on the same side as the U.S. You're against me. Everybody's against us. The whole you know everybody's against what we're doing. So he puts him in the same um, picture, in other words, as they do things like that, as the U.S. showing that he's on the U.S.'s side as well, uh, and that everybody's against him. All right, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so uh, Chase, to your point of the hand slap, that is Khrushchev. That is old Russian um, uh, autocratic. It's, it's the tradition of Russian leadership that he's going back to. And that suggests to me, at this point, he's starting to lose some elements of his training, because I know Alan Pease was brought in to soften those, those elements. So for example, uh, more open hand gestures, more steepling rather than these crushing gestures that we start to get. We start to get this crushing gesture around holding on to your borders, holding on to the things that are yours, and in what we'd expect to be the not so dominant hand. So it's interesting that his left hand seems to be the dominant one. He is right handed, yet he does wear his watch on the right hand. There's all kinds of reasons he gives for that. But if you see him walk, you'll see his his left hand swinging, you'll see his right hand very, very still. There's theories around uh, tr weapons training around that, that he's going to keep the hand near his weapon ready for that, and the other hand will become dominant. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but certainly it is quite interesting how we we don't see him as a predominantly dominant hand gesture. It's his subdominant hand that seems to gesture more. Point of interest there. Um, yeah, I like I like the bat off gestures that he's given there. Like you're saying there, Scott, the distance, but also it allows him to shove this question off and on to somewhere else and just kind of batted away somewhere else, a bit like he uses, again, that laugh that we saw before and the breaking of eye contact to just bat things away. Very diminishing of everything that's going on here. Uh, there, that's all I got on that one. All right, one thing, let me add something to that arm swing and stuff, Mark. The studies now show that if you don't have the even uh, arm swing back and forth, that's, that's a key to a lot of those people end up... Uh, getting into dementia later on in, in life. So he's older now, and that may be, I'm not saying he has dementia at all. I'm just pointing out that's one study that we, we know about that, whether it has anything to do with what you're talking about or not. I don't know. I'm not going to lean into it, pretend it does when it doesn't. What are you going to say, Greg? Usually military guys always move their arms the same because we hold our hands a certain way. All that stuff is so wired in our brains. <laughs> Nine to front, yeah. six to the rear. We all know how that works, right? And that's how you can spot those guys, you all, yep. Greg, yep. at a distance, at the airport, at For the sure. mall, walking around downtown when you see that, that gate like that. Yep. So anyway, just throwing that in. In the case of neighboring Ukraine, uh, earlier this year, the European Union said you had more than 100,000 uh, troops on the Ukrainian border. Uh, was that an attempt to get Washington's attention? Look, first, Ukraine itself constantly, and I think is still doing that, it kept bringing personnel and military equipment to the conflict area in the southeast of Ukraine, Donbass. That's one. Two is that we conducted exercises in our territory, and not just in the south of the Russian Federation, but also in the Far East and in the North and in the Arctic. Simultaneously, military exercises were being held in different parts of the Russian Federation. At the very same time, the US was conducting military exercises in Alaska. Do you know anything about it? Probably not. But I'll tell you that I do know. And that is in direct proximity to our borders. But that's in your territory, on your land. We didn't even pay attention to it. What is happening now? Now, at our southern borders, there is a war game, Defender Europe. 40,000 personnel, 15,000 units of military equipment. Part of them have been airlifted from the US continent directly to our borders. Did we airlift any of our military technology to the US borders? No. Do you worry that your opposition to NATO has actually strengthened it? For six years, NATO has spent more on defense. That's some defense. 
some defense. During the USSR era, Gorbachev, who is still, thank God, with us, you can ask him, got a promise, a verbal promise. However, it was a promise that there would be NATO expansion to the east. Where are those promises? Two waves of expansion. Where is that, where is that written down? Where is that promise written down? Right, 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 right. Well done. Well done. Correct. You've got a point. Nya, nya, nya. Got you good. Well, congratulations. Of course, everything should be sealed and written on paper. But what was the point of expanding NATO to the east and bringing this infrastructure to our borders? And all of this before saying that we are the ones who have been acting aggressively? Why? On what basis? Did Russia, after the USSR collapsed, present any threat to the United States or European countries? We voluntarily withdrew our troops from Eastern Europe leaving them just on empty land. Our people there, military personnel, lived there for decades in what was not normal conditions, including their children. We went to tremendous expenses. And what did we get in response? We got in response infrastructure next to our borders. And now you are saying that we're threatening to somebody. We're conducting war games on a regular basis, including sometimes surprise military exercises. Why should it worry the NATO partners? I just don't understand this. We All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you'll have to bear with me as I geek out a little bit on interrogator talk here. This guy is an Intel pro and you can't miss it. He goes to ridicule and criticism. He does pride and ego down, which is when I start to attack you personally. And then he goes to love of country on this guy, trying to get him to, to feed back. And then he reframes the argument to get to where he wants. In the very beginning of this interchange, you can see he needs a minute or a moment to think. Watch him drift his eyes down left and touch his mouth or his face. So usually I think of this when a person is doing that. Now, could he be signaling that? Sure, but I don't think he is. I think this is he's preparing what he's going to do. And then he comes right out, right out of that, after that down left gaze and starts this approach. He ridicules him. He does the equivalent of har, har, har. You know, ha, ha, ha. Like when I was a young soldier, we'd make fun of people who would do something really stupid. We'd just laugh out loud at them to be funny, but also to make them change the behavior. If they said something that didn't make sense, we would go at them that way. So he starts down that way, he runs those approaches. And then when he actually gets to the point and he ridicules him with the clap, that's something childlike, but powerful when a leader of a, of a nation does it to you. So he pushes him, but we're starting to see something that bothers me a lot more. He's got, he starts to illustrate with his eyebrows when he's hitting the key points that matter to him and i'm starting to see something i see personal extinction or i see fear of extinction in what he's saying the message is clear now could he be just saying that sure he could be just saying that but it sure doesn't appear to be that it looks genuine his punctuation is at those same moments and his face is making the point that you put us in a place where we are in danger even though we gave you everything mark what do you got yeah, so I, my biggest note here is here he is, because this interviewer, to give credit to the interviewer, has knocked him out of some of his newer training into his older training, which is that KGB training. He's back to some of his first professional training there. So really interesting. So he's flippant at the start. Now, flippant is not glib. He is dis disrespectful ultimately, uh, rather than shallow and insincere. He is disrespectful of this moment. And just as Greg is saying, that disrespect is designed to lower the status of that other person. I, I maybe don't think that he quite understands this might be where the interviewer is trying to get him, to bring him down to some of his his earlier persona. Understand, uh, Putin is a complex human being who has got proficient at a number of jobs, a number of professions along the way. So different elements of the persona start shining forward. Um, here we get, uh, after got you good, we do get, I think, the eyes targeting, we get anger and we get disgust. So again, I say, here he is. Here's something more of the real Putin. Anger, uh, disgust and, and, uh, and targeted eyes. And then we get his gambit, which is an innocent gambit. Uh, I don't 
I don't understand. I don't really understand this. The playing of innocence, but we do see disgust shine through as well in a micro gesture during that. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you guys completely. And on top of the innocence, we also see a victim narrative being displayed there. So it, it might look like there's some hesitation going on in the beginning of this, but keep in mind that he's the interpreter in his ear is finishing up translating the question. So that might be, I just don't want to get inundated with the comments there. Then I'll have to tell a victim story. <laughs> so there's no hesitation in there. Uh, there's so many questions. This reporter is using worrying. And so, if you watch the whole video, he uses the word worry so much. I have no idea why. I, can't, I could not figure it out. But when he's saying NATO spent more on defense, while that is being translated and while he's processing this question before it's answered at all, we see eye avoidance, blink rate increase, and eye flutter and mouth covering. You know that, Greg, you were, uh, you pointed it out right away. And when he's saying, uh, where is it written down? He's shaking his head the whole time. He's showing contempt on his face, which we know what contempt looks like, that one-sided smile, which means we're uh, speaking with disdain or feeling disdain about another person. And there's some narrowing of eyes. And that's uh, interesting because provoking this man to this level of focus is pretty hard to do from all the interviews I've seen him do. And there's also anger. You actually see a flash of anger on his face for one moment. Well, there's two moments, but one where it's really powerful is when he's talking about leaving these military families alone. That made him angry. And I think uh, he's feeling maybe for his people. But we go back to the, the original Putin strategy where there's fact, 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 fact. There's four facts in a row. Then there's questions to drive your focus. What did we get in response and why should it worry NATO? And finally, uh, with the arms wing, there are two open source intelligence agency reports written by a government. I'll just say a government that uh, suggest that there is an onset or early stages of the onset of Parkinson's disease that is at play. And they've been able to kind of confirm this with a bunch of doctors that I, I'm not a doctor, but these doctors believe that they're witnessing on video the slow progression into the early stages of Parkinson's. So that might explain the arm swing. I'm not an expert. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. We see the most direct and solid eye contact we've seen up to this point. Because this is important because it gets busted there, which we'll get to in just a second. He touches his mouth like Greg was saying. People do that. He's actually thinking at that point. He's thinking through what's going what's to come up. His, skate, his cadence is strong and steady. And um, his tone is solid. His volume is solid. Everything's good on, the, on, on that end. And then when he says, where, that, where, uh, where is that written down? That's when he's busted. And then you see him stick his tongue out. And what usually happens is you'll see when somebody gets busted, they'll go, and put their, their tongue in their teeth like that. But he does it with his lips because he's, he's contained. He's really um, at this. He's not really contained, but he's trying to contain those outbursts like uh, Mark was talking about earlier. He's been trained to do that. So when he's busted, uh, he like, he's trying to move on like nothing's happened at all. But then he realizes he can't get past that. So he has to, has to admit to it. He has to call it for what it was, say, yeah, that's what it was. So hopefully it'll go away and won't, it won't look like it means much at that point because what's he going to do? Um, and then he pushes back in his chair and has his chin down. Um, and this shows that he's in, that suggests he feels embarrassed about what happened, but he's still trying to uh, make a comeback from that. Now, I agree, Chase. We see several times uh, the anger uh, expression in here. We would see it more because if you'll, if not if you, Chase, if you'll pay more attention, Chase, not like that, but if you'll look really closely, you see a lot of uh, play in the, in the glabella and part of the eyebrows. But again, I believe Botox is playing a part in there, so we're not seeing the subtleties we would usually we usually see in there uh, because of that. Do you worry that your opposition to NATO has actually strengthened it? For six years, NATO has spent more on defense. That's some defense. Some defense. During the USSR era, Gorbachev, who is still, thank God, with us, you can ask him, got a promise, a verbal promise. However, it was a promise that there would be NATO expansion to the east. 
Where are those promises? Two waves of expansion. Where is that, where is that written down? Where is that promise written down? Don't do that. Right, 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 right. Well done. Well done. Correct. You've got a point. Nya, nya, nya. Got you good. Well, congratulations. Of course, everything should be sealed and written on paper. But what was the point of expanding NATO to the east and bringing this infrastructure to our borders? And all of this before saying that we are the ones who have been acting aggressively? Why? On what basis? Did Russia, after the USSR collapsed, present any threat to the United States or European countries? We voluntarily withdrew our troops from Eastern Europe leaving them just on empty land. Our people there, military personnel, lived there for decades in what was not normal conditions, including their children. We went to tremendous expenses. And what did we get in response? We got in response infrastructure next to our borders. And now you are saying that we're threatening to somebody. We're conducting war games on a regular basis, including sometimes surprise military exercises. Why should it worry the NATO partners? I just don't understand this. We All right. We good? Yeah. Yeah. Smooth. Will you commit now not to send any further Russian troops into Ukrainian sovereign territory? Look. Did we say that we were planning to send our armed formations anywhere? We conducted war games in our territory. How can this not be clear? I'm saying it again because I want your audience to hear it. I want your listeners to hear it, both on the screens of their television sets and on the Internet. We conducted military exercises in our territory. Imagine if we sent our troops into direct proximity to your borders. What would have been your response? We didn't do that. We did it in our territory. You conducted war games in Alaska. God bless you. But you had crossed an ocean, brought thousands of personnel and thousands of units of military equipment close to our borders, and yet you believe that we are acting aggressively, and somehow you are not. Just look at that. Pot calling the kettle black. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I don't think he, he really answers the question, but he does invoke this idea of tit for tat, which when people start taking up arms, tit for tat, you, you know, I do one thing, they do the other. Have you ever seen the Laurel and Hardy film, tit for tat? Very, very funny. This is not very, very funny. It's very, very funny uh, when Laurel and Hardy do it. Very, very serious when armed forces start doing tit for tat. So I don't like that that comes in uh, at this point point where I just noticed when we were watching that replay, when he talks about territory, he shows disdain. So again, Chase, to your point that we saw it earlier on, disdain isn't just disdain for uh, an individual. Disdain is a whole society. It's a whole group. Again, worrying when you start to talk about armed forces, because it's not going to war with an individual. You are going to war with that whole group. You don't have a problem with one person. you got a whole problem with a group of people. So this is setting up for what is to come later on. Um, now he he mocks with this kind of tight pr protective gesture, I think around the idea of 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 America's uh, Alaskan uh, borders with 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 Russia. It is mocking. It is flippant again and disrespectful. Um, and then we have this this tilt of the head at the end and the kind of movement of the mouth at the end. Again, soft gestures that I think that I certainly know uh, Alan Pease was responsible for helping him with to be just a little bit softer. Uh, but that really is a regulator at the end to go, you know what, job done. I've mocked you. Job done. Point scored on that one. Greg, what do you got on this? Don't be pretty short on this one. This is how he lies. When you are taught to resist interrogation, you're taught not to outright lie because you'll get caught. I mean, I, we're good at catching lies. What we're not good at is dealing with the person who avoids answering the question. And that's what he does effectively. He does what I would call parallel conversation. So if, if you ask me a question about, ask me a question about driving too fast, Scott, 
Greg, do you drive too fast? Have you seen my old truck, the one that I bought last year to drive down the farm? I'm going to bring up something that's related, so it sounds like we're talking about the same thing. Then I'm going to go down the thing, and then I'm going to tell you that Georgia speed limits are unreasonable. And if they would just change them, I would never get another speeding ticket. He just did parallel conversation, which means he doesn't have to answer the question. Still sounds like he's in the ballpark, and he's talking. And I agree with you, that's mocking. I see disdain as well when he's talking about territory. And he has a logical argument. The logical argument is what makes him capable of redirecting the conversation. This is a beautiful job of redirecting and still not answering. Chase, what do you got? If everything is true that he said here, which all those things are true, and if that were the whole picture, I would be in 100% agreement with Putin. He frames this like a master and I think I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think the interviewer is a good person. The interviewer is probably extremely sharp and intelligent, but it's absolutely no match uh, for this level of training and this level of polish that this person has. Imagine going from like Jason Bourne to being in the White House. You have, <laughs> you'd outperform a lot of people. And I think that's what we're seeing here, the way he masterfully weaves this. Putin uses even deeper levels of his methods here. He gets us to agree with him that we're watching this on a screen and we're watching it on the internet. He automatically gets us to say, oh, wow, he, he's saying something that's happening to me right now. So I'm starting to buy into what's going on just with this stupid little comment. So I went back and watched several hours of past video today. I downloaded it, watched it on the airplane. And he is very consistent with these shoulder shrugs to get buy-in from the other person and the right, uh, the right for positive things, his left hand for negative or controversial things that he doesn't like or he views as negative. But he continues the method here. Take a look at the video when it comes back up. Fact, 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 imaginary scenario, and then using questions to drive your focus. And I guarantee you, even knowing this formula, it's going to work and it will drive where you're focused on. You can see it in the video coming up. Scott. All right. I'm going to touch on a little bit of, I think we're all seeing the same stuff here pretty much. So I'll be just touching a different uh, spot on, on what you guys have covered. At the very beginning, we see that quick um, little lip purse at the beginning that indicates that he's not he doesn't agree with this he sees this as a problem then we see his eyes darting around and when when people's eyes dart around they're processing a threat or negative information um when he lips his licks lips his licks lips his lips that's a he's preparing to speak at that point there's really not much there it's just he's just prepping to speak and he's pretty aggressive at this point uh he he's gets his head going forward we're seeing a lot of of um Ag aggressive facial expressions. We're seeing anger, and like you, you guys were saying, disdain as well when it comes to the U.S. This is, and he's using the most illustrators we've seen so far up to this point, or the largest ones we've seen so far. Uh, but he, he's he's really aggressive at this point. Will you commit now not to send any further Russian troops into Ukrainian sovereign territory? Look. Did we say that we were planning to send our armed formations anywhere? We conducted war games in our territory. How can this not be clear? I'm saying it again because I want your audience to hear it. I want your listeners to hear it, both on the screens of their television sets and on the Internet. We conducted military exercises in our territory. Imagine if we sent our troops into direct proximity to your borders. What would have been your response? We didn't do that. We did it in our territory. You conducted war games in Alaska. God bless you. But you had crossed an ocean brought thousands of personnel and thousands of units of military equipment close to our borders, and yet you believe that we are acting aggressively, and somehow you are not. Just look at that. Pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. All right. If the People's Liberation Army made a move on Taiwan, uh, how would Russia respond to that? <laughs> Are you aware of uh, China's plans to militarily solve the Taiwan problem? I don't know anything about that. 
As we frequently say, politics do not require the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is inappropriate in politics. There is no could be and uh, would be in politics. I cannot comment on anything that is not a current reality of the modern world. Please bear with me. Don't be upset with me. But I think that this is a question about nothing. This is not happening. Has China stated that it intends to solve the Taiwan problem militarily? It hasn't happened so far. For many years, China has been developing its relationship with Taiwan. There are different assessments. China has its own assessment, the US has a different assessment, Taiwan may have its different assessment of the situation, but fortunately it hasn't come to a military clash. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, this is bad, because he's familiar with this question and he's prepped for it, he's ready for it. As he gets into it, he laughs and he sits up and closes his jacket. These are adapters and barriers writ large on this. He says, I don't know if, uh, when he says, uh, when he refers to Taiwan as a, as a problem, that's a big red flag. Because when he says, do you, are you aware of, the, of, of Taiwan being a problem? That's a huge red flag there. And then that hard lean left, we, and as well, it shows he knows that problem that that problem exists, and that he's already talked about it with China. I think they've already been in cahoots. They're, they're in cahoots over this, and he's they he already knows what's gonna what's coming. I think at that point, or he's got a pretty good idea of it. I'll just I'll just say that uh, that hard lean left, he's bracing uh, because this this is the position he's always using when he's talking about something where he goes in and says, this is the way things are. This is my feeling on it. This is my believing or what I believe in it. And this is what's going to happen next. That's always where he's leaning as long as left when he starts into that. Uh, like I was, I was talking about that earlier. Um, when, it, when he says the subjunctive mood is inappropriate in politics, to quote Dr. Phil, it's all about that. It's all about what's going to happen if this happens. What will we do if they do this? What will we do? It's all... Uh, it's all that's all hypothetical when you get in there and start going through those things. That's what he's trained in. He, he's all about that. That's probably why he's blowing it off so hard. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so I think he gives a tired sigh at the end there. Um, again, as a brush off, he is being thoroughly dismissive and playing power here and brushing off this fly of a of a question this gnat of a question tired of the ideas of do, even doing thought experiments with this interviewer here um status plays there's some single shoulder shrugs but i i don't know at this point whether they're congruent or incongruent with what he's what he's saying it's tough to to work out his feet do move into a more stable position towards the end of it so i would say towards the end of this i think he feels like he's stable he's scored a good point with this he has won over on this interviewer the interviewer had moved him into imbalance just a few videos before and Putin's back again with this brush off, this laughing, some stability, and he's not going to play the imaginative games that the interviewer wants him to play. Chase, what do you got? I agree with both of you guys. And I think a lot of the behavior that we're seeing here does indicate that there is a potential that he does know and he has spoken. He is aware of, the, of what's going to happen in Taiwan. He shrugs his shoulders after some emotional eye processing, which his eyes move down to where humans access emotion. Uh, I know what's been said about the eye movement thing. You see it on TV. Most of that stuff is BS. Some of these things are extremely reliable. Very few, but some, and that's one of them. His feet go crazy again, higher than baseline and more than baseline. There's a potential, I think, for some contempt on the face, and this is all while speaking about his not- uh, this not being a current reality in regards to the Taiwan invasion. And I want you to see when this clip comes back on, this is how powerful GHT is, or like which hand someone uses for positive, which hand somebody uses for negative. GHT is 
so powerful. You can see it, I think, six times in this video. Go from negative to positive, negative to positive. You can see it perfectly. And it's right at the moment that he discusses the name of each one of these countries and whether he sees them as good or bad. So watch out for this negative and positive hand movement. The next time you see him start speaking, now that this uh, invasion has begun into Ukraine. That's all I got there. Scott, or, I'm sorry. Greg. Yeah, so a couple of things. Scott, I think when he says the problem, I think it's common usage between them they, that I, I believe China calls it the Taiwan problem. So it may be why he's mm -hmm. using that word. However, okay. I do believe he knows more than is going on. I, my note for this says sarcastic, foolish boy lecture is what this is. When he comes right out of the gate, that laugh is, <laughs> yeah, sure, is dismissive. He does some eye blocking and he's genuinely amused. You can't miss it. There's a of exasperation, like, I can't believe you're bringing this up. He starts to lecture. And as he starts talking about China's plans, you see him lecture and he does kind of a lip grip. Now, here's one caveat and one red flag. I know for a fact from Russian friends that there's some sound they make when they're talking and they go like that. It's a tss sound and they draw their lips back. So I'm always cautious when I'm talking about a Russian. But I see a lip grip when he's talking about China's plans, like he's doing some withheld information where there's emotion or something else. I also see him lecturing him with sarcasm in his face and telling him exactly how things are because he doesn't know. And Chase, I agree with you. He's masterful at using his shoulders at the right time. This to me feels like, yeah, he probably knows. And when you see that eye movement down right, down left, down left we associate with internal voice or, or trying to figure out how things work. Down right, we associate with emotion. And when a person's talking about a relationship that may be developing, may be complex, you would expect them to be thinking about it from an emotional point of view and how to integrate that into what they're thinking and how to talk about it effectively. So it doesn't surprise me. By the way, most common thing I see in complex business problems Every day when I'm dealing with corporate America is you talk to a leader and they're trying to figure out how something will work. It's how do I explain this? How does it work? I feel this way. Um, you can see it. I see it all the time. It's when I know that a leader is up against the wall and they don't know how to deal with the situation. So it, it's powerful. And in this case, it might be a good indicator. That's it. So what's this thing with the uh, side of the mouth? And that Tell, what do you, There's a sound. Is, they draw their mouth back they, when they're doing some kind of a sound. They'll make a kind of a sound. What does it TS mean? TS kind of sound. I, it's just the way it's a letter. It's Remember, oh. all languages have sounds that others don't. Arabic has a single sound called dud, and no other language has it. So some languages have odd sounds, others don't. I think Greek has that too, so I see it. Okay. Says it. I thought we were, I thought I was missing something at that point. No, no. If the People's Liberation Army made a move on Taiwan, uh, how would Russia respond to that? <laughs> Are you aware of uh, China's plans to militarily solve the Taiwan problem? I don't know anything about that. As we frequently say, politics do not require the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is inappropriate in politics. There is no could be and uh, would be in politics. I cannot comment on anything that is not a current reality of the modern world. Please bear with me. Don't be upset with me. But I think that this is a question about nothing. This is not happening. Has China stated that it intends to solve the Taiwan problem militarily? It hasn't happened so far. For many years, China has been developing its relationship with Taiwan. There are different assessments. China has its own assessment. The U.S. has a different assessment. Taiwan may have its different assessment of the situation. But fortunately, it hasn't come to a military clash. Распад исторической России под названием СССР на их совести. Несмотря на все эти несправедливости, обман и откровенный грабеж России, наш народ, именно народ, признал новые геополитические реалии, возникшие после распада СССР, признал новые независимые государства. И не только признал. Россия сама, находясь тогда в труднейшем положении, помогала партнерам по СНГ, в том числе украинским коллегам, от которых прямо с момента провозглашения независимости стали поступать многочисленные запросы о материальной поддержке. 
И наша страна оказывала такую поддержку с уважением к достоинству и суверенитету Украины. По экспертным оценкам, которые подтверждаются простым подсчетом цен на наши энергоносители, объемов льготных кредитов, экономических и торговых преференций, которые Россия предоставляла Украине. Общая выгода для украинского бюджета на период с 1991 по 2013 годы составила порядка 250 миллиардов долларов. Но и это далеко не все. К концу 1991 года долговые обязательства СССР перед иностранными государствами и международными фондами составляли порядка 100 миллиардов долларов. И первоначально предполагалось, что эти кредиты будут возвращаться всеми республиками бывшего СССР солидарно, пропорционально их экономическому потенциалу. Однако Россия взяла на себя погашение всего советского долга и полностью по нему рассчиталась. Окончательно завершила этот процесс в 2017 году. Взамен новые независимые государства должны были отказаться от своей части советских зарубежных активов. И соответствующие соглашения в декабре 1994 года были достигнуты с Украиной. Однако Киев эти соглашения не ратифицировал. Why he wanted to join the KGB. One of the key phrases that really stood out to me was that he said, quote, one spy could decide the fate of thousands of people. And I think that speaks to his personality. And like we said earlier, Putin went crazy with these photo ops. They were staged. No judgment. I've posed for a whole lot of stuff just to look cool uh, on the Internet before. But these were way over the top. They were almost this satirical illustration of masculinity, strength, and, and this vigor. And we're seeing the same level of narcissistic behavior start to express itself. And this is a crystal clear example of what I continuously, continually say, that all of us, all humans, are an adult product of childhood suffering and childhood reward. He had a rough upbringing. And he learned a lot of this stuff. So Putin used the rage and these overreactive responses to negative stimuli as a child and what some people call wound collecting. And it worked for him. If it worked, like Greg always says, on, if you're a subscriber to the show, Greg always says the organism is going to do what, what makes it survive. And it worked. So we all find a little behavior pattern that works for us as kids in response to threats or uh, anything that could hurt us. And this was his. And we're seeing that play out on now a global scale, uh, a probably a behavior learned in childhood. And we're seeing these narcissistic behaviors start to play out. And it's even worse because he is social. He's very social. He didn't he didn't lash out at his teachers if he was reprimanded in private. When he was reprimanded in public is when the really bad stuff happened. So this has happened publicly. So it's triggering a lot of this stuff, a lot of these psychology aspects, a lot more than it usually would. And I'll leave the body language because I'm going to be talking about a lot more of that in the future here. So, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so this for me, this is where it starts getting worrying because this is the start of his justification for the offensive. And we'll get there in one second, but let's look at the body language here. Big out breath of tension there, big out breath of CO2. So metabolism is up, I would say at this point. There's a, there's, look, he's, he's got this relaxed position that he had before, but he's no longer relaxing on the beach. It's rather, it, his tension is super high, but he's still in this relaxed position. He's trying to suggest that he's relaxed but we can see from the tension state in his muscles that his metabolism is right up at the moment we see disgust nothing different there he's shown us a lot of disgust but disgust with this tension level as well that's something different his hands are now partially hidden so he's not taking territory with his hands his 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 uh his left hand i think or maybe it's his right um but one of his hands is is spread out so he does do downward push gestures and he does have a little bit of confidence with that but it's not the same 
confident, relaxed person that we saw before with these emphatic spread finger gestures. Uh, interesting pictured there with a very old display of power, those phones lined up. I have more communication power in my hand right now than he's displaying there, but he's showing you the old Russia. It's the Khrushchev Russia again, lots of phones image on the monitor there of the Kremlin. So the old power structure uh, is very different from, his, you know, his his opposition right now, which is Zelensky, uh, who is creating a an online offensive uh, against him. Very different KGB versus actor comedian. Very, very different communication styles there coming out. Um, Okay, so look, here's the big story that he's pushing here, which is important. The Ukraine didn't pay its debts, and he's going to offer us a, a big narrative here, which I call the debt that must be paid. You well know, if I say to you, hey, you haven't, they haven't paid their debts, they haven't given over the money that they should give over, or you haven't given over the money that you should, something in your mind goes, well, that's kind of wrong, and I'll probably have to pay for that eventually. So we have a narrative in the human mind that says, if you don't pay your debts, you have to pay for it eventually. And this is his, the start of his justification for invasion is, um, it's just nature's way that if you don't pay your debts, it will cost you. And here comes the cost. We'll see some more justifications coming up, which are even more dramatic, uh, even more worrying, uh, to use the interviewer's uh, choice of words there. But this is the start of the worry that it is justified, the invasion, because debts must be paid. And if you don't pay in cash, you have to pay another way. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, mine's going to be fairly short on this one. Uh, we see those deep breaths where he's breathing out hard. The part you're talking about there at the top, Mark, this was a long, this was a long speech, and he does that quite often when he gets in there. And at this point, he's when he comes to the end of a thought or he comes to the end of the the point he's making, he's just been through it so many times. He's over it at this point. He's he's and uh, when Greg and I were talking about this, we both did uh, uh, news shows the other day on these video on a couple of these videos we've seen. I think there were one or two of them were in here, Greg. And uh, we both said the same thing. Greg, Greg and I talked about beforehand about we were, we were both seeing, and it was that he was contained and just locked down the whole time. This is completely different body language than we were seeing earlier. Completely different. Completely different. Looks like a different person. This is a man with a lot on, on his mind, and this is somebody who's mad. He's angry at this point. So when he's letting that air out, he's just he's. That's one point gone. Now he's moving on to the next point because he's he's got that built up stress and tension, and he can't get rid of it. He's really tr he's trying to be uh, really locked down at this point. Um, all these indicate everything we're seeing here indicates that he's mad, that he's angry, that he's upset, but and he's worried at the same time too. His, his cadence is fast and it's strong, and it's his voice is loud and the tone is good and it's all right there. His diction is almost impeccable when it comes to the way he's been talking up to this point. He talked fine at this point. You could understand him perfectly if if you could understand Russian. I'm sure you could understand him perfectly. But right now, if I knew a hint of Russian, I could understand it because it's so clean and so clear and so so poppy. He wants to make sure he gets his point across on this. This is this is a really big deal to him. Um, there's nothing smooth or or clean or easy about his um, illustrators either. He's just he's he's just sitting there like this, and his hands, like you were saying earlier, Mark, they're not taking up space. They're just plop back here. They're just plop down on the table like this, and we see him move a little bit here and there. And he's and I believe he's he's trying to keep all that stuff contained. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. <clears throat> There are a couple, you said a couple of things, Mark, when you're talking about his posture being the same, but not the same, there's no life to his limbs. I often say when you look at people, you can tell a lot about how much fluidity there is to their limbs. Comfort and happiness makes us more fluid and lighter and stress and anger makes us wooden, rigid and locked down. And he's holding the desk very tightly and he'll occasionally pick his hand up and he'll use that emphatic with his left hand when he has a, a point to score. He's gone away from passion. You don't hear passion here. He looked fluid and passionate in the other thing. He looks wooden here. He's lecturing. 
browbeating, head down. He's telling. His posture now is about telling, and he's going to tell you how it is. He enunciates because this is a speech, and he needs it to be clear what he's saying. And he's starting down a path. And Chase, you're right. I always say the organism does what made the organism successful. He's not in this case, which scares the hell out of me. Because what he's doing is he's not going, we are Russia, we have a right. He's starting to play the blame game and the we got cheated game. But his, it's clear. He says, look, we cleared all that out. And his hands are very clear when he illustrates. He's saying, look, Russia paid their dues. Russia did all this. His illustrators are clear. But then he's using, unlike Russians typically, to your point, Mark, maybe it's Alan got through to them, but at the same time, that pounding the desk was, we will bury you. We have the right. Every Russian leader has said, we are Russia. We have the right. All of them, he's not. He's starting to say, we got cheated, and we're going to do it because we got cheated. That's new for him. That scares me a little bit. Распад исторической России под названием СССР на их совести. Несмотря на все эти несправедливости, обман и откровенный грабеж России, наш народ, именно народ, признал новые геополитические реалии, возникшие после распада СССР, признал новые независимые государства. И не только признал. Россия сама, находясь тогда в труднейшем положении, помогала партнерам по СНГ, в том числе украинским коллегам, от которых прямо с момента провозглашения независимости стали поступать многочисленные запросы о материальной поддержке. И наша страна оказывала такую поддержку с уважением к достоинству и суверенитету Украины. По экспертным оценкам, которые подтверждаются простым подсчетом цен на наши энергоносители, объемов льготных кредитов, экономических и торговых преференций, которые Россия предоставляла Украине. Общая выгода для украинского бюджета на период с 1991 по 2013 годы составила порядка 250 миллиардов долларов. Но и это далеко не все. К концу 1991 года долговые обязательства СССР перед иностранными государствами и международными фондами составляли порядка 100 миллиардов долларов. И первоначально предполагалось, что эти кредиты будут возвращаться всеми республиками бывшего СССР солидарно, пропорционально их экономическому потенциалу. Однако Россия взяла на себя погашение всего советского долга и полностью по нему рассчиталась. Окончательно завершила этот процесс в 2017 году. Взамен новые независимые государства должны были отказаться от своей части советских зарубежных активов. И соответствующие соглашения в декабре 1994 года были достигнуты с Украиной. Однако Киев эти соглашения не ратифицировал. Вместо партнерства стало превалировать иждивенчество которая со стороны киевских официальных властей подчас приобретала абсолютно бесцеремонный характер. Достаточно вспомнить перманентный шантаж в сфере энергетического транзита и банальное воровство газа. Добавлю, что в Киеве пытались использовать диалог с Россией как предлог для торга с Западом. Шантажировали его сближением с Москвой, выбивая для себя преференции. Но в противном случае будет расти российское влияние на Украину. При этом украинские власти изначально, хочу это подчеркнуть, именно с первых шагов стали строить свою государственность на отрицании всего, что нас объединяет. Стремились исковеркать сознание, историческую память миллионов людей, целых поколений, живущих на Украине. Неудивительно, что украинское общество столкнулось с ростом крайнего национализма, который быстро приобрел форму агрессивной русофобии и неонацизма. Отсюда и участие украинских националистов и неонацистов в бандах террористов на Северном Кавказе. Все громче звучащие территориальные претензии к России. Свою роль сыграли и внешние силы, которые с помощью разветвленной сети НКО и спецслужб выращивали на Украине свою клиентуру и продвигали ее представителей во власть. Важно понимать о том, что Украина, по сути, никогда не имела устойчивой традиции своей подлинной государственности. И начиная с 1991 года пошла по пути механического копирования чужих моделей, 
оторваны как от истории, так и от украинских реалий. Политические и государственные институты постоянно перекраивались в угоду быстро сформировавшихся кланов с их собственными корыстными интересами, не имеющими ничего общего с интересами народа Украины. Yep, so here is where the justification offensive really, really starts. I'm just going to focus on the words. Now, I don't know how accurate the words are in this translation, so either it's worse than I think or it might be better than I think. But let me tell you what I've got. So here's how he's framing uh, Ukraine. Parasitic, so it dehumanizes, they're not human. Brash, so that's subhuman, uncivilized. Blackmail, they're criminal. Cultural manipulation, so they're uncultured. Mental distortion of the populace, so there is a collective madness. Nationalist, and so they're separate. Aggressive, and so they're angry. Russophobic neo-Nazi, so that is just racist, okay? Which is interesting, because they have a, a Jewish president right now. And then he ends with terrorist, and so, you know, that's mainly just all of the above. He then continues with territorial, they have no authority, they're unstable, they're mindless, they're separatist. That's a lot of propaganda 101 in a very, very short space of time. 101 probably meaning, you know, the first lesson in it and the worst room you could possibly be in. So it is a, it's unfortunately, um, a, a massive red flag for a setup of a destruction of a nation. This is exactly what you do in order to justify when you're going to go into a country and, and justify to your people why this people are going to get destroyed. Extremely worrying on this one. Greg, what do you got on it? Yeah, so a true believer does not know that they're not telling the truth because to them it is the truth. That's the first thing to remember. So when we watch him, he's coming out of the gate. His right hand is what he uses when he's delivering some message that he's not sure how to be perceived. His left hand is driving points that he perceives as power and that kind of thing. I don't know if it's negative or positive, but I think when he's uncertain, his right hand comes in. Or if he needs to make a really emphatic, we'll see it later. When he, it's interesting to listen to his cadence. You don't have to be able to speak his language. I say this all the time. I grew up in a world where people speak many different languages in my army career. And even in my own personal life with my in-laws, I'm like a dog in the room. I understand every fifth word. I'm like, you know, whatever they say, I'll pick up on. So if you pay attention, you'll hear the smooth cadence as he gets up to Ukrainian nationalist and then a pause and concern and his face wrench when he says neo-Nazis. Really interesting. And then once more, his face does that same wrenching when he says territorial claims, loud territorial claims. Now, whether that's because he believes that, doesn't believe it, and he's saying it, who knows? Something is different in his baseline there. He does say this has nothing to do with Ukraine's interest, and he does a lip retraction, pulls his lip back in his mouth. I think there he's asking for approval, whether we see it or not. And when he talks about this blackmail piece, you see strong disgust in his face. So what is he convinced of? What is he trying to convince others of? Let's pay attention and see when he's using his right hand, when he's using his left, and what his signaling is. But I'm with you, Mark. He's clearly trying to sell, hey, there's a whole bunch of really bad people living next door. I'm going to go over and burn the house down tomorrow. That's what I see. Scott, what do you got? I agree 100%. He, he's, he's building up his case, man, at this point. And to go back to The True Believer, Eric Hoffer wrote a book called The True Believer. It's one of the first things Greg and I ever bonded on was that book. If you're a big reader, get check that book out. Great, great author and a fantastic book. It's a classic. You got to read it. The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. All right. Uh, earlier, I talked about when he was leaning left, that indicated his his aggression and his aggression and telling it how it telling things how it is from his perspective. If you'll listen to what he's saying when he's leaning to the left, this is everything we're talking about when when he's talking about how bad things are and how bad these people are and setting up his he's getting he's this in something like this. There's it's like a, hitting a baseball or a softball when you're practicing. You throw it up come back and you hit it. It's like comedy, the rule of threes. One, two, three. Right now he just threw the ball up. So he's getting ready to come back and then hit it in the next few videos we see. So he's setting it up right now. Um, his cadence is even faster at this point. His diction is still really good and clear and clean. So that's important because he wants to make sure he gets all these points across. Plus the fact he's angry. Uh, 
which we, we see out on his face as well. Um, to make sure all of his points get across, come across, especially when he's leaning to the left, he's really he's rehearsed this a lot. And this is there's a lot of times he's been over this, and he's he's almost over it at this point. Like I was saying earlier, he's just resigned to what's happening. I think he knows what's coming. I think he's got. A, I think he's already decided what's going to happen, and so that's what we're seeing. Uh, he's thinking about that. So when he's speaking about analytics and things like that, about the dates and the the um, foreign models and the technical things. He relaxes a little bit. Those things really, I'm, I'm sure they're important to him, but they're not the big points he wants to make at, uh, at this section. So he relaxes a little bit, but then he ramps back up when he gets into the other stuff. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, you guys covered a lot of that uh, stuff that I was going to cover, and it's perfect. I agree with all of it. And there's some really similar stuff here that we're going to see over these next few videos. There's a lot of repetitive facial expressions, a lot of repetitive emotions that you're going to see. But it's painting and building a bad guy. It's, he's showing you a statue of a bad guy. And his speaking is so effective here. Uh, I could muddle through it in Russian, uh, but it's so effective that even if you don't speak Russian, you'll get lost. It, it will suck you in because it is, like Scott said, this dictation is perfect. Uh, there's only, uh, to mark to your point about the translation there, I had it screened through a real live Russian and uh, these are highly accurate. So the first couple of videos, there were some mistakes, but all of these in this setting are going to be uh, very accurate. I think there's some cue cards going on here as, as well. But you can go back through this video and look at his face. You can do it with the sound off if you want to. But every time you see the lip curl up, this means kind of contempt. Uh, when you see everything on the face kind of moving towards the middle, like if you stuck your nose into a rotten jug of milk and what your face would do is kind of show that disgust, everything moves towards the middle. This is mostly when he's discussing uh, Kiev in particular. Finally, most of the facial expressions here of anger, when you see his, him actually show anger, are during the discussions about the Ukraine, I'm sorry, Ukraine's government in general as, as a group. And, and their behavior. So it's interesting that there's a repeating pattern that we're starting to see. We'll see if that continues in the next video. That's all I got. Место партнёрства стало превалировать иждивенчество, которое со стороны киевских официальных властей подчас приобретало абсолютно бесцеремонный характер. Достаточно вспомнить перманентный шантаж в сфере энергетического транзита и банальное воровство газа. Добавлю, что в Киеве Пытались использовать диалог с Россией как предлог для торга с Западом. Шантажировали его сближением с Москвой, выбивая для себя преференции. Но в противном случае будет расти российское влияние на Украину. При этом украинские власти изначально, хочу это подчеркнуть, именно с первых шагов стали строить свою государственность на отрицании всего, что нас объединяет. Стремились исковеркать сознание, историческую память миллионов людей, целых поколений, живущих на Украине. Неудивительно, что украинское общество столкнулось с ростом крайнего национализма, который быстро приобрел форму агрессивной русофобии и неонацизма. Отсюда и участие украинских националистов и неонацистов в бандах террористов на Северном Кавказе. Все громче звучащие территориальные претензии к России. Свою роль сыграли и внешние силы, которые с помощью разветвленной сети НКО и спецслужб выращивали на Украине свою клиентуру и продвигали ее представителей во власть. Важно понимать о том, что Украина, по сути, никогда не имела устойчивой традиции своей подлинной государственности. И, начиная с 1991 года, пошла по пути механического копирования чужих моделей, оторванных как от истории, так и от украинских реалий. Политические и государственные институты постоянно перекраивались в угоду быстро сформировавшихся кланов с их собственными корыстными интересами, не имеющими ничего общего с интересами народа Украины. Напомню, еще в апреле 2008 года на Бухарестском саммите Североатлантического альянса США продавили решение о том, что Украина и, кстати, Грузия станут членами НАТО. Многие их европейские союзники, европейские союзники США уже тогда прекрасно понимали все риски подобной перспективы. 
но были вынуждены смириться с волей старшего партнера. Американцы просто использовали их для проведения ярко выраженной антироссийской политики. Ряд государств-членов Альянса и сейчас весьма скептически относятся к появлению Украины в НАТО. При этом из некоторых европейских столиц мы получаем сигнал, мол, что вы переживаете, это не произойдет буквально завтра. Ну, собственно, и американские наши партнеры тоже об этом говорят. Хорошо, отвечаем мы, не завтра, так послезавтра. Что это меняет в исторической перспективе? По сути, ничего. Более того, нам известны позиции и слова руководства Соединенных Штатов о том, что активные боевые действия на востоке Украины не исключают возможности вступления этой страны в НАТО, если она сможет соответствовать критериям Североатлантического альянса и победить коррупцию. При этом нас раз за разом пытаются убедить в том, что НАТО – это миролюбивый и сугубо оборонительный союз. Мол, никаких угроз для России нет. Опять предлагают поверить на слово. Но реальную цену таким словам мы хорошо знаем. В 1990 году, когда обсуждался вопрос об объединении Германии, советскому руководству со стороны США было обещано, что не произойдет распространение юрисдикции или военного присутствия НАТО ни на один дюйм в восточном направлении. И что объединение Германии не приведет к распространению военной организации НАТО на восток. Это цитата. All right, Greg, what do you got? So this one for me is pretty loaded. He starts off with a couple of adapters. He even does a little subdued finger drum. So he's releasing nervous energy. My head, my headline for this is inflamed, contemptuous, and helpless. So here comes his key message. He does emphasis with his left hand almost to the point of pounding and has contempt in his face as he gets up to a single finger and points out the senior partner in the situation, being the US. So he's pointing out the hidden perpetrator, Chase, your thing, the vanishing perpetrator. He's calling out a perpetrator. The US caused this problem. His voice tone changes, he goes to frustration, and then his right hand starts to slam down in emphatic, and he rolls his hand up like a helpless palm and his elbow goes away from his side. If he did that intentionally, That's masterful because that's the sign of helplessness. Look, what can I do? And his face shows disgust at the same time. Then his voice tone and his brow take on this plaintiff kind of thing for what am I going to do? They won't even exclude them. They get all these human rights violations. Then he, he does that both sides of his mouth down kind of thing at contempt and or I'm sorry, at disgust around this is how they see it. And then he does kind of a win some, lose some kind of look as he gets to the end of it and shows contempt in his face very clearly when he's talking about an agreement that NATO would not move one inch. This is starting to show the picture of what he's angry about and who he's angry with, in my opinion. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. His, uh, you're right about the cadence. It's, it's back to speeding up again. And his right hand is gesturing. Uh, just like you were saying, those illustrators are indicating that these point, points are, are the most important to him right now. Um, I'm trying to cover stuff he didn't cover. Uh, lots of expression and anger in his teaching face again. There's something I learned from, from Greg a while back. And these are morphing quickly into to other expressions, which aren't big. These are The expressions we're seeing mostly are anger and sort of a blank face you know so let's talk about mood for a minute we don't often talk about moods on here and quite often what happens with a mood is you you in other words re-experience something you experienced earlier your brain goes back and revisits the emotions you were feeling earlier and that brings it into to the spot you're in now we could be i'll be talking and everything be good but somebody would be in a bad mood quote unquote so what's happening there is they're just remembering those those emotions be they be they whether they're anger or or a sadness, or whatever the emotion is that brings it back, uh, that they're living through that as you're talking to them. And from here, I think he's, he's showing um, the mood of anger and, and resolve at the same time because he's been talking about this, and he's really mad. Obviously, he would be because this is the main thing going on right now. So we're seeing that the, the mood of anger because of his thoughts uh, leading up to this. Speeches he's given before... We don't see we we haven't seen him like this before, uh, maybe a long time ago, but not not in the in the past ten years. I don't think I'm not, that that I'm aware of. So his his mood, I think those 
those conversations and those statements he's been making and being mad earlier are setting the mood for this uh, speech we're seeing here. All right, Chase, what do you got? I studied uh, Parkinson's since we're kind of on this for a couple of years and I've took some ridiculously long exams on it, but I'm not a doctor, but as a, as a behavior expert, if a person was uh, a recipient of a Parkinson's diagnosis, this is what I would tell them to do with their hands. Rest your hands on the table, let your wrists hang limp, let the weight come down to, to maintain stillness, keep your gestures very short, quick, and return your hand to the table as soon as you possibly can. And it's exactly what we're seeing here. I'm not saying he has Parkinson's, but just another example, you can see disgust on his face when he's talking about the promises that were made to him, the promises that were made, the anger when he's discussing NATO. So it's a lot of victim stuff. And this, I think this goes along with the very commonly accepted beliefs from independent experts and Western intelligence agencies that there is a, this lifelong history of what the largest psychological research paper on Putin calls something that they, they titled nursing injustices. And this is applying the concept of being wronged in order to le legitimize action in the name of some kind of grievance and somebody pissed me off. So this gives me a hall pass to go and do these things. And he's just trying, I think, to share that level of frustration and anger and make that contagious to the people that are watching this video uh, in, in Russia. Not sure what the effect is, but uh, I think that's what the attempt uh, certainly is. That's all I got. Mark, there you go. Yeah, so I think if you're right, Chase, that there is a, a personal feeling of wrongdoing, what's happening now is it's being deflected onto a nation. So, you know, if we look at the story, we've got... Uh, people who don't pay their debts properly, and these people are parasitic, and they're criminals, and they uh, and they hate Russians, and they're Nazi, and they're terrorists, and they they have no brains, and they're just mad, 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 mad. But behind all of that is another group who don't keep the deal around keeping those people in their place as well, and so there is this deflection onto the US are anti-Russian. Now, I don't think, to your point, Chase, I don't think he truly believes that to be accurate because we get this movement of his tie and a shift around that area. So I don't think he's as confident as he wants us to feel that that is the real problem, that the US are anti-Russian. I, I, I absolutely suggest he's saying it. He did say it. But I think that uh, consciously or unconsciously, he knows that he feels there's a direct attack on him, not a direct attack on his people. He's uncomfortable, I think, with how big that statement is is and i see that in this out of baseline for him movement of the tie and and move we don't see it certainly i haven't seen it in any other place around here and it's around such a big statement if i were making that statement and i believed it to be true i wouldn't be moving around at that point that would be my moment to say here's the perpetrator here's the person who's really in command who's the group who's in command and i would knock that right down the camera he kind of fidgets around on that Напомню, еще в апреле 2008 года на Бухарестском саммите Североатлантического альянса США продавили решение о том, что Украина и, кстати, Грузия станут членами НАТО. Многие их европейские союзники, европейские союзники США уже тогда прекрасно понимали все риски подобной перспективы, но были вынуждены смириться с волей старшего партнера. Американцы просто использовали их для проведения ярко выраженной антироссийской политики. Ряд государств-членов Альянса и сейчас весьма скептически относятся к появлению Украины в НАТО. При этом из некоторых европейских столиц мы получаем сигнал, мол, что вы переживаете, это не произойдет буквально завтра. Ну, собственно, и американские наши партнеры тоже об этом говорят. Хорошо, отвечаем мы, не завтра, так послезавтра. Что это меняет в исторической перспективе? По сути, ничего. 
Более того, нам известны позиции и слова руководства Соединенных Штатов о том, что активные боевые действия на востоке Украины не исключают возможности вступления этой страны в НАТО, если она сможет соответствовать критериям Североатлантического альянса и победить коррупцию. При этом нас раз за разом пытаются убедить в том, что НАТО – это миролюбивый и сугубо оборонительный союз. Мол, никаких угроз для России нет. Опять предлагают поверить на слово. Но реальную цену таким словам мы хорошо знаем. В 1990 году, когда обсуждался вопрос об объединении Германии, советскому руководству со стороны США было обещано, что не произойдет распространение юрисдикции или военного присутствия НАТО ни на один дюйм в восточном направлении. И что объединение Германии не приведет к распространению военной организации НАТО на восток. Это цитата. Excellent. Более того, скажу сейчас то, о чем никогда не говорил публично. Скажу об этом впервые. В 2000 году во время визита в Москву уходящего со своей должности президента США Билла Клинтона я спросил его, а как Америка отнесется к тому, чтобы принять Россию в НАТО? Не буду раскрывать все подробности этой беседы. Но реакция на мой вопрос внешне выглядела, скажем так, весьма сдержанной. А как американцы реально отнеслись к этой возможности? Фактически видно на их практических шагах в отношении нашей страны. Это открытая поддержка террористов на Северном Кавказе пренебрежительное отношение к нашим требованиям и озабоченностям в сфере безопасности, в расширении НАТО, выход из договора по ПРО и так далее, и так далее. Так и хочется спросить, зачем? Зачем все это? Ради чего? Ну ладно, не хотите видеть в нашем лице друга и союзника, но зачем же делать из нас врага? Ответ только один. Дело не в нашем политическом режиме, ни в чем-то другом. Просто им не нужна такая большая, самостоятельная страна, как Россия. В этом ответ на все вопросы. Это и есть источник традиционной американской политики на российском направлении. Отсюда и отношение ко всем нашим предложениям в сфере безопасности. Сегодня достаточно одного взгляда на карту, чтобы увидеть, как западные страны сдержали обещание не допустить продвижения НАТО на восток. Попросту обманули. Since this one's kind of similar to the other videos. So step one, and you're going to see it when this video comes back again, get attention with a tension building phrase that maybe something like I've never said this before. So next, the hero of the story tries and then fails. And next, the hero starts to feel bad and he communicates this to you. He makes you start to feel it with him. He pulls the empathy in because he sucked you in from the beginning. I'm opening up and I'm saying something I've never said before, which makes you might open up a little bit more, especially if you have empathy. So next, the hero is betrayed by the people that he wanted to join over and over. The hero is betrayed. And then revert to questions to direct your focus, telling you exactly what you should be considering. And you'll hear that as the next step. Finally, the big giant country, unwanted by the others. This shows us uh, a lot here. And uh, the final two steps here is showing us the big country was lied to again and again. And then he leaves this open. That what's the next step in the hero's journey? To fix it all, to right all of the wrongs. So he get kind of takes us through this little hero's journey of a story that we're all used to seeing on TV and film. And that's the logical next step of this story is for that person to come out and, and actually get stuff done and fix all of these wrongs. It's almost this one video clip is almost the storyline of the BFG kids movie, the big friendly giant. And it follows along that kind of story tale. So, Scott, what do you think? All right. 
he's holding the grudge. This guy's got a big grudge, which is a common trait of, of uh, in psychopathy. Just throwing it out there. Uh, he makes a big deal about the question that, that he was asked by Clinton. And uh, he says, but I'm not going to tell you that answer. How ninth grade of you? That's that. That's really how to. That's really how to handle that as a leader. The throat clearing things I think he has are real. I think that's because it, this has been a long speech, and is he's breathing heavy in and out a lot. And I think that's 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 true throat clearing at this point. Um, the fingers on the desk again. Those at this point, I'm with you, Chase. It's kind of making him look dumpy, and it just looks it's starting to look odd. Now that's one of Mark's big things. He would never let anybody put their fingers up on the on a table like that it just looks it looks odd it's odd looking so maybe something's out of place there i don't know um and the big moment i think in this video is when he says they just lied and he kind of dumps back in his chair like that gets that chin down and um it's this, this to me sounds like, like somebody who's over it who's just who's just about had it at this point um mark what do you got yeah so i agree that the the breathing um, is, is is most likely because he's just tired by now. It's a big it's a big speech to get through. The coughing is probably losing moisture. I don't think it's about the stress of the situation. Uh, his his left left hand becomes more dominant, so he's back into his left hand negative rhetoric and places this idea it's quite interesting for me how he's moved now uh from ukraine to there's something more important you know don't look there uh look over here because there's a big player over here that just doesn't like other big players it's not even now about they don't like russians it's that they don't like anybody who's as big as them and it and and it is that idea of well that's just not fair so to your point chase he really is playing upon this idea of it's not fair if you don't like somebody who's as big as you just because they're that big. You're just not playing fair. He's getting his Russian people distracted over here at another big kind of bullish, um, unfair player. And now forgetting about this Ukraine issue because we've we've kind of dealt them out as being subhuman anyway. And it's, it's now a, a bit of a fait accompli that we're going in there we now just need to look at this bigger player over here and get upset with them. Again, pretty worrying. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so being a Cold War era soldier, I've met a lot of Russians over my life. We need lots of Russian interpreters. We need lots of those folks. And I have good friends who are in the Russian specialty, some that worked in the Moscow embassy and the Kiev embassy, all those kinds of things. There are two things about the Russian psyche we need to not forget. And people who, Russians who are watching this, please comment. But Russians gave a lot in World War II. It's not called World War II in Russia. It's called the Great Patriotic War. And I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but I believe it was 25 million people they lost. In a single battle, they lost 250,000 people. In those days, in World War II, it was horrendous for them. So their ability to back up into friendly territory and defend themselves has been part of what's kept them alive. As my old friends would say, the bear wakes and hibernates. That's how they survive. What he's doing here is futility. This is futility. What he's saying is we've tried to play, we tried to become one of them, and we can't. So we need Ukraine because we need more space. That's exactly what this whole thing is, and it is masterful. He is doing something that you classically do. Look, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but right, I'm only saying this because I have to, because Clinton said something to me, and I'm even going to tell you what it was, but it was inappropriate. His brow shows concern and he does kind of a half smile that's contempt or something there. And then he withdraws his lower lip just as he's saying that. This, with his hands on the table, Scott, while I agree with you normally, I would say that's bad. This is part of the entire thing. It's exasperation, rounding of shoulders, dropping your hands in futility to the desk, exasperation in your voice, deflation in your body language and turtling, that's defeat. And then flexion in his brow and half face, at matter of fact, and then he goes to direct eye contact as he's trying to drive home his point to these guys. This is driven. I see resignation. I said this to Scott when I first watched the video. I sent him a note and said, tell me you don't see resignation in this guy because that's a scary thing. If he's not doing it intentionally, which I don't think he is, I see 
hopelessness. And hopelessness is not a good thing in true believers. So we'll get to what I think of the whole thing at the end. But I see a lot going on in that video. This com connected to the last one is disturbing. That's what I got. Более того, скажу сейчас то, о чем никогда не говорил публично. Скажу об этом впервые. В 2000 году во время визита в Москву уходящего со своей должности президента США Билла Клинтона я спросил его, а как Америка отнесется к тому, чтобы принять Россию в НАТО? Не буду раскрывать все подробности этой беседы. Но реакция на мой вопрос внешне выглядела, скажем так, весьма сдержанной. А как американцы реально отнеслись к этой возможности, фактически видно на их практических шагах в отношении нашей страны. Это открытая поддержка террористов на Северном Кавказе пренебрежительное отношение к нашим требованиям и озабоченностям в сфере безопасности, в расширении НАТО, выход из договора по ПРО и так далее, и так далее. Так и хочется спросить, зачем? Зачем все это? Ради чего? Ну ладно, не хотите видеть в нашем лице друга и союзника, но зачем же делать из нас врага? Ответ только один. Дело не в нашем политическом режиме, ни в чем-то другом. Просто им не нужна такая большая, самостоятельная страна, как Россия. В этом ответ на все вопросы. Это и есть источник традиционной американской политики на российском направлении. Отсюда и отношение ко всем нашим предложениям в сфере безопасности. Сегодня достаточно одного взгляда на карту, чтобы увидеть, как западные страны сдержали обещание не допустить продвижения НАТО на восток. Попросту обманули. Более того, нас опять пытаются шантажировать. Вновь, вновь угрожают санкциями, которые, кстати, я думаю, они все равно будут вводить по мере укрепления суверенитета России и роста мощи наших вооруженных сил. А предлог для очередной санкционной атаки всегда будет найден. Или попросту сфабрикован. Причем вне зависимости от ситуации на Украине. Цель одна – сдержать развитие России. И они будут это делать, как делали это раньше. Даже вообще без всякого формального предлога. Только потому, что мы есть. И никогда не поступим со своим суверенитетом, национальными интересами и своими ценностями. Хочу четко, прямо сказать, в сложившейся ситуации, когда наши предложения о равноправном диалоге по принципиальным вопросам фактически остались без ответа со стороны США и НАТО, когда уровень угроз для нашей страны значительно возрастает, Россия имеет полное право принимать ответные меры обеспечения собственной безопасности. Именно так и будем поступать. I, very little on this. All I'm going to tell you is go back to video number seven, I think it was, in this series, and see the first video and see the difference in his body language. He was still early in the speech. By this point, he is now deflated, smaller, contemptuous, and angry, and telling and drawing lines is what I see very clearly. Uh, Chase, what do you got? We're seeing disgust, anger, and the story completion. So we're seeing the author of this narrative start to get the story a little bit closer to the finish line. And that's what we're seeing. So any of these speeches that we see pre-war, pre-huge national action speeches, you hear an archetype and you hear a storyline start to come to a close because we want people to think that's the next step. That needs to be the logical next step. But just think about this speech, and this is all I'll say about the whole thing demonizing a particular group and making them almost subhuman and then directing the anger of a nation at that group as a way to salvation. It should maybe sound familiar. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, here's his final frame, I think, for um, the U.S. and NATO is, is blackmail, so they're criminal. They threaten, so they're bullies. And they sanction, so they punish. So they are criminal, bullying, punishers. So again, this is Propaganda 101. 
uh, then he finishes, and, and just as was being said there, there is disgust all the way through this as well. He finishes with this idea of this is going to happen regardless of what they do. They are damned if they do and damned if they don't. You're right, Greg. He is resigned at this point. He's saying to the, the Russian people, I believe whatever we do, if we do a good thing, it's going to work out this way. If we do a bad thing, it's going to work out this way. It doesn't matter what we do with this bullying oppressor. It's going to go the same way. And so it is a fait accompli. We are resigned to it. And I think that is his justification. They're set now to go into Ukraine is what will happen will happen. It's, it's already deemed, it's already designed. We, we have to resign ourselves to this is the only thing that can be done. There is nothing else to do. So it really is quite a propaganda journey that, he, journey that he's taking the Russian people on here. Scott, what do you got? All right. Throughout this, we see a lot of pronounced anger expressions, several of them that are hardcore, just anger. He's speeding up again. And... Um, He's laying out, laying out all the reasons he has a right to re retaliate against the U.S. if we step in or if anybody steps in. He's saying this is why we're gonna, we can do this. Um, his voice is strong and clean and clear still. And um, his, I think his facial expressions are telling us everything. And I think um, at this point, uh, well, he points out everything the U.S. does and how everything we do is negative against Russia. And I, so I agree with you. I think at this point he's just he's just resigned to it. And yeah, it makes sense, Greg, th that he's just he's defeated. He feels he's deflated and feels defeated. I think he's over it, but I still think he's locked down, trying not to show as much as he can. He can try not to show at this point. Более того, нас опять пытаются шантажировать, вновь вновь угрожают санкциями, которые, кстати, я думаю, они все равно будут вводить по мере укрепления суверенитета России и роста мощи наших вооруженных сил. А предлог для очередной санкционной атаки всегда будет найден или попросту сфабрикован. Причем вне зависимости от ситуации на Украине. Цель одна – сдержать развитие России. И они будут это делать, как делали это раньше. Даже вообще без всякого формального предлога. Только потому, что мы есть. И никогда не поступим со своим суверенитетом, национальными интересами и своими ценностями. Хочу четко, прямо сказать, в сложившейся ситуации, когда наши предложения о равноправном диалоге по принципиальным вопросам фактически остались без ответа со стороны США и НАТО, когда уровень угроз для нашей страны значительно возрастает, Россия имеет полное право принимать ответные меры обеспечения собственной безопасности. Именно так и будем поступать. Let's talk about what we think is going on here. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, if I were to direct you back to any video, it would be video eight, where we went through that series of metaphors and ideas that are classics for if you want to justify going into a, 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 a separate territory and destroying a people throughout history, these ideas have been classically used. So I'd like to bring your attention to those. Chase, what do you think? I think we're seeing a lot of psychological traits here and a lot of people will, our, our first instinct is to say, well, I need, I'm seeing the whole bunch of crazy stuff here. I need to codify that. I need to funnel that down into some kind of diagnosis as fast as I possibly can, which is great. But the moment that some, let's say he goes and sees a psychiatrist and gets diagnosed with narcissism then everyone's just going to say, oh, he's a narcissist, so he's doing all of this stuff. That will be the reason for every future behavior. But keep in mind, we're, we're seeing maybe a person with narcissistic traits who also has X, Y, and Z, who's also like has these situations, which we all have. We all have some little situation that has the capacity to bring our level of self-control to zero. And there's a lot of that stuff going on in this situation so outside of the mental behavior there's other things going on but that maybe the misdiagnosis or this uh this psychology is largely at play but there's some other stuff that are going on with this person's life and how they grew up greg 
Yeah, guys, I always say it doesn't matter what you got. It's what you do with it, right? So it doesn't matter if he's whatever he has. What he has, we know for sure, is the ability to make rational decisions. He's gotten somewhere through making some rational decisions to get him to places. What I think I see here is a person who really does believe there's futility. It, nothing I do is going to matter. doesn't matter whether what he heard is exactly what happened. And guys, let's also not pretend that this kind of thing doesn't happen in the world, that somebody doesn't get allowed into NATO so that you can do something. Let's No politics at all here. This is a safe zone for that. Big fan of Russian folks, Ukrainian folks, had lots of friends from different parts of the world. And this is not a condemnation of one or the other. All I see here is a guy who has in his mind, I said to somebody the other day, I think he feels like he's a savior of the Russian people because he talks about ethnic Russians in Ukraine. And there are a lot of ethnic Russians in Ukraine. There are also ethnic Russians in other areas. The real danger is when does it stop? So even if there were incursions in the border and that kind of stuff he's, that he's talking about, when do you stop? Because there's ethnic Russians in Poland. There's ethnic Russians in other places. So where does it stop is the danger. I don't worry so much about him being a narcissist. Of course, he has help. Go look inside the beltway if you want to find some narcissists. That it, they're drawn to the business like moths to a flame. So the only thing I want to do is to pay attention and say, is he hopeless? Hopelessness scares me a little bit with a guy who's got access to that kind of force. That's the thing that I'm concerned about here more than anything else. And the last thing I would leave is if we misread something cultural, for example, the breathing, because we're listening to it from outside. Every language has different breathing patterns because of the way you pronounce. Some languages speak on the inhale at times. So we don't know all that. So. If you're a Russian speaker, put notes down below, please. Keep it positive if you can, because we learn from you. The same thing about anything cultural, because we're not Russian specialists. So, and please don't take anything we're saying as derogatory to your culture. If you come from Russia, this is all about a specific person and the body language you're seeing. Scott, what do you got? I think this has been a great example of body language. We're seeing the the same person when they're confident, when they're relaxed, and when they're they know what they're going to say, and and they're and they're there for the show. And then we're seeing that same person who's supposed to be confident, and he's supposed to be a little relaxed, and there for the show. But we see an entirely different uh, set of circumstances going on uh, psychologically for him at this point. So. It's a great example of seeing someone go from the that relaxed, hey, I've got together, I'm the coolest guy in the world, to this guy over here telling you he's he's good and telling you what he's doing is right and telling you some things have happened to him and these things are wrong and all these people did bad things and it's not our fault and this always happens to us and, you know, watch out. I think we're seeing a, a, a verbal finger wag there in a lot of ways. So I think that's a, a great example there. And I agree with you, Greg. It's It's worrisome. It's got me worried. And I think we're going to see uh, this is going to be part of, uh, of course, it's part of history. But I think there will be some historic things done the next while that we'll remember for a long time, I think. Good, I hope. Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. Please subscribe to the Behavior Panel.